So, Laura, um, I want to let people know the kind of work that you've been doing and, and how deeply you're invested in this. Um, Laura, you were the senior deputy chairman of the NEA during the Obama administration and asso associate director at the Rockefeller Foundation, chair of the board of Global Giving, an advisor to Shift Capital, and a consultant with McKinsey and Company's social sector office. So you have been living and breathing this idea of investing in creativity and seeing it from all different angles and all different right. responsibilities. So when we're talking about investing in creativity, since you've seen it from all these different angles, what are two or three issues that you think are important to remember or to consider when we start talking to people about investing in creativity? Thanks, Allison. So we're focused on impact investing. So this is very consistent with the conversation about corporate social responsibility, where you're thinking about a financial bottom line and a social impact or a social bottom line. Uh, the conversation this morning has been so interesting. There's been a focus on employees, there's been a focus on customers, but I think it's equally important to have aligned capital coming from investors who care about financial return and social impact together. So what we're doing at Upstart Collab, we're connecting impact investing to the creative economy. And that's the economy of ideas. It's the economy of art and design, media, entertainment. It includes food and fashion and a whole range of the things that really are at the core of our culture. Can I roll back and ask this, the Journalism 101 question? Can you define impact investing for people who are not familiar with the term? Impact investing is where you're investing for a financial return, stocks, bonds, but you're equally focused on the social return, the social impact, the good thing that that business is going to be doing in the world. You said to me backstage something that I found kind of interesting. You said impact investing has gone mainstream. Yeah. When wasn't it mainstream and why wasn't it mainstream? Well, I would say impact investing has been evolving over the last 25, 30 years. We had a speaker earlier talking about community development and community development finance institutions. They were kind of the beginning part of impact investing, where people were thinking about how to bring capital to low-income communities to make them more livable, to provide affordable housing, to invest in small businesses, to create jobs for local community members. So that's been going on for about 25, 30 years. And I would say in the last 15 years, it's expanded. We have had microfinance come on the scene, Muhammad Yunus being recognized for helping make small size loans to individuals who are going to do small businesses in the developing world and now all around the world. So those have been some of the steps on this journey of impact investing. And over time, more investment capital has been coming into this space. So the idea of impact investing going mainstream is when people are looking at the numbers, how much capital, and where it's coming from. So in the United States, $8.7 trillion is invested in some way connected with social impact, social responsibility, trying to do something positive. That's a lot of money. And just to put it in contrast to philanthropy, philanthropy in the United States is $390 billion a year. So billions versus trillions. Um, more, uh, more individuals are entering impact investing, and especially younger people. Next gen, millennials, they've come up already this morning, and they are part of what's what's happening when we talk about impact investing going mainstream, meaning more people are participating. Even though it's going mainstream and there's an enormous amount of money, you've made the point in various uh, lectures you've given that there is minute amount invested in creativity compared to the biggest part of creativity being part of our GDP. I think it's 4% of our yeah. GDP, yet close to 0% invested in creativity? Why is that? That seems crazy. So it hasn't been invested on purpose. And what we're trying to do at Upstart Collab is 
get people to do this intentionally and to do it because they realize the power of creativity to do good things in the world. If you look at where impact investing money has been invested, it's invested in affordable housing, it's invested in manufacturing, it's invested in food and agriculture. And in all of those categories, there are going to be things connected to the creative economy, affordable housing for artists, uh, manufacturing in the ethical fashion field, those types of things. But if you went to your uh, wealth advisor today and you said, I would like to invest for impact in the creative economy, I would be very sure they would come back and say, Allison, sorry, there, that's not an option. Would you like to invest in community development or for environment or for education instead? What's the disconnect? Is it just lack of information, lack of knowledge? We talk about it as needing a creativity lens because a lens is a viewfinder. It helps you to bring into focus the things you've been missing and if there are folks familiar with impact investing here today, they probably realize that we're borrowing a little bit from gender lens investing, which has grown up over the last eight years or so, getting impact investors to be a little bit more mindful about how their capital may be uh, supporting companies with women in leadership, uh, family-friendly policies, making goods and services that are focused on women as a market. And so it's not as if that hadn't been happening before, but people hadn't been noticing it. It had been flying under the radar. And that's what's happening right now with the creative economy as well. With impact investing, when you're talking about the arts and creativity, does it make sense to go to smaller investors. We talked about millennials, some of whom have a bit of change, maybe they got involved in the tech boom early, as opposed to going to these large corporations and saying, hey, we have these amazing artists, and you might go to a corporation that's more conventional and more traditional. Yeah. A younger investor might be open. You know what I'm finding? The, the place where there's the most enthusiasm and take up for this idea, it is with individuals who can follow their own values and make a decision and be a pioneer and champion something that's new. So increasingly foundations and larger institutional investors are investing for purpose, investing aligned with their foundation's mission. And that's a more arduous process to have that conversation about something new. There's a board of directors, this is a new area. So they're not necessarily the, the first leaders into the new territory, but individuals, especially individuals who have been arts patrons, uh, they've been on the boards of arts organizations, or they're individual artists, they're creative people themselves, they have a value and a love and an appreciation around art, design, creativity, entertainment. They see the power of that. And so when they're investing their capital aligned with their values, that's one of their values, they would like to include that in their investment portfolio. So yes, people, and especially younger people, are the, the way this is really going to get going. Is part of your organization's mission to find those people? Yes, so we're helping to sort of bring this market into view, and a market has buyers and sellers, so in this case, people deploying capital and people raising capital to scale and sustain their ideas. So we are getting to know who's out there in, in both of those categories, who get this and want to be part of this new creativity lens, and helping them find each other. I want you to tell our audience about Lori Meyer Cloud. She's an example of someone like this. Lori Meyer Cord is an impact investor. Uh, there was an article on Lori's, uh, one of Lori's investments in the New York Times about a year ago. And she herself is a painter, she's an artist. She's a very active impact investor. And she had been asking her wealth advisor, listen, I'm really glad my investments uh, related to the environment and women and girls and the other things in my portfolio, but I'm an artist, I love arts, what could we do to do impact investing related to the arts? And her advisor said, I'm sorry, I can't find anything, I've been looking around. So we were introduced to Lori. We connected Lori with a community development investor who's been around for a long time. They've been working in low-income communities for a long time. And we connected 
that community development investor with a terrific group called Artspace. Artspace is a nonprofit real estate developer. They do one kind of development. Uh, affordable live workspace for artists. Here in New York, they have PS 109 up in Spanish Harlem, but they have 40 other artist affordable housing sites around the United States. So what we did at Upstart, we connected the dots. We found an impact investor who cared about arts and creativity. We connected her to the ecosystem of community development and her money was able to flow into projects that make it more affordable for artists to live and work in a place like New York City. And so that's at the heart of what we think is possible. Connect the dots, use what's already out there in impact investing, and just make it more possible that some of that money will be flowing to the creative economy. How do the artists feel about this? I mean, aside from getting a lot of money, that's a great to have a, sort of a grant, a foundation, somebody to let you, allow you to do your work without having to worry about paying your rent. But do they have any concerns about being told what to do with their art, being, entering a very conventional situation, perhaps with a larger company who wants money? So the artists are the bravest ones in this whole conversation. And especially the artists that I call artist innovators. These are artists who choose to work beyond the studio, beyond the theater, beyond the concert hall. They are engaged in their communities. Some people describe it as having a social practice. A lot of these artists are starting social purpose businesses, and a social purpose business doesn't run on grants. It runs on aligned capital, impact capital. So part of what motivated us to start Upstart was conversations with these artist innovators who said, look, how, how do I get into this whole circle, this network of impact investing. Uh, I know how to get a grant. I know how to get a commission. I know how to paint a painting and sell it. But the next idea that I want to take forward, it's a business idea. I need investment capital. And I can't quite find my way to impact investors. So not every artist, uh, not the artists who lead a more traditional practice, but the artists who are focused on the needs of their neighbors and the needs of their communities, who are using technology, who are using retail, who are using fashion, who are using food as a way to make their change in the world, they absolutely want this capital and can't find it quickly enough. I'm going to ask one more question and take a couple from the audience before we wrap up. Um, when you talk about artists being innovators. I know part of your mission has been to try to convince large corporations and companies to bring artists on board, to be problem solvers. Right. But a lot of people who work at these big corporations want metrics. They want to know, yeah. what is this going to get me? Why is this good for my bottom line? Why is this good for my shareholders? Why is it? And can you provide them metrics? So th I think Atlantic, the Atlantic has helped us because there are three stories in the magazine that's here today that speaks exactly to that question. One is I, the way I, I sort of represent why artists as innovators have a role to play in business, government, and in the social sector. One way to make the case is look at history. And the Leonardo da Vinci cover story, I think, is a great example. Uh, here's an artist. He, obviously, he did beautiful works of art that are selling for large amounts of money. But he also <laughs> had an intuition and a foresight that helped him to imagine helicopters and parachutes and tanks and all of these things way before there was any technology to make this a, a reasonable idea. Uh, and there's a whole list of artists that we've written about who historically have seen something before it was obvious to anybody else. So that's one part of the, the way I would make the case. Another is just to say, Listen, CEOs, when they answer surveys about what's important for their company, top on the list is creativity. Creativity and leadership, creativity in their workforce. They say they can't find enough people who can bring creativity to their companies. They can't hire them fast enough. So we don't have to convince them that creativity is valuable. We just have to help them to see that maybe some of the people they should be considering hiring are not 
with an MBA, they're with an MFA or have another set of skills and preparation. Uh, the other piece of this, I think, is around cognitive diversity. Mm -hmm. And there's been a lot of conversation about bringing capital to women entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs of color, with the basic understanding that not all good ideas will come from the same place. And I, I say yes, cognitive diversity has also been shown to help teams perform hard tasks better and faster. And if you take a belief in the power of creativity and an understanding of the value of cognitive diversity and you put those two things together, to me that says you need to bring artist innovators into your business, into your government agency, into your social sector organization. As they say, what is it, great minds don't think alike? Great minds do. don't think alike. Um, do we have any questions? Yes. I'm, Can you stand up? I'm Andrea. Thank you. I'm an MFA trying to mingle through all those things. And I was wondering how you make the gap between the vocabulary that you use yeah. and how whenever you spot a big idea that doesn't have a good business plan, how do you sustain and keep it alive until you're able to put it in the market? So I, I think I heard the first part of the question. I may not have heard the second part of the question. But the first part was around jargon and vocabulary. And that was actually one of the first things that got us to realize that there was a role to play to build a bridge or connect the dots between the artist innovators and the impact investors and the other allies to creative people doing good things. It's as simple as, is it a value proposition or is it uh, you know, sort of the, the original core of, of your creative work? Understanding that what an entrepreneur is and how the traits of an entrepreneur are so similar to the traits of an artist who's coming up with an original solution to the world that they see around them. So we, we found that one of the first things we had to do was help these two groups recognize all the things that they have in common. We've talked about all the interesting things and the important things and the smart things about this process. For you, though, what is the biggest challenge to getting this done? You've laid out very clearly why it's a good idea and sort of cognitively we all understand intellectually. But what's your challenge to making this happen? Everybody wants to be first to be second. Right? So when you're doing something new, you're looking for those pioneers and those champions who say, I believe in this good idea and I want to be an ambassador for it. And the folks that I'm hoping will step forward as ambassadors are impact investors. So either existing impact investors who recognize and have a deep connection, recognize the importance of creativity and want to see that in their portfolio, or folks who maybe haven't been engaged in impact investing yet, but they are endowed cultural organizations, there are foundations that were started by artists, there are creative people who've built wealth, uh, or they are sincere arts patrons who recognize that they can do more with their investment portfolio than they can with their gift giving and their philanthropy. And if those people step forward to make the capital available, there is a whole wonderful cohort of artist innovators with ideas that will do well and do good, that are just looking for capital that's aligned with their values. As to what Professor Kogut said earlier, yeah. be brave, right. have a little courage. Yeah. Laura Callahan, thank you so much. Thanks so much.